Mori, who is a 17-year-old, applies for a contest called The God of High School. As time goes on, he acquires a pair of friends, Mira and Daiwi, and they eventually become inseparable. After Modi's grandfather is kidnapped, Miri and his friends strike a deal with the director of the tournament to win the contest in return for having a piece of information about the whereabouts of his father. At an island, a group of blackmailers make a call threat to Mr. A Party Leader about the bill he had submitted to the National Assembly. After the threat call, a deliberate bizarre wind engulfs the island, ending the lives of the blackmailers. In the party leader's office, his secretary reports that their team is ready to release the information to the media platforms in two hours as planned. The party leader, who has a bold red X mark on his left palm, smirks and announces the beginning of their motives. A helicopter pilot riding across the island, where the blackmailers had previously occupied, is astonished to see a bold X marking and three lines tattooed into the small piece of land. In the next scene, an old man comforts his grandson on a rainy night in the street. The man encourages him to go on with his life, start school, and make friends. After his little speech, the man turns around and walks away. Mori, the then little boy who is now a high schooler, wakes up in his room and stares at the portrait of him and his grandfather hanging on the wall opposite him. He shifts his stare to his smashed alarm clock and gives a shockful expression. Mori aggressively rides his bike through the street while accusing himself of sleeping in on a day he had deemed important. The city billboards simultaneously announce the start of a martial arts tournament for students across the country, popularly referred to as the God of High School. On the train, the radio informs the listeners that the city preliminaries will be held at Korg Arena. Three high schoolers gush over being able to stream stream online and simultaneously in other locations, the younger generations are all hyped about the beginning of the long-awaited high school contest. In a convenience store, a staff member who appears to be a properly fit high schooler places a box of goods on the ground and talks about his urge to punch out the stress. The acting cashier thanks the high schooler for working the night shift before prelims to the contest. In the next scene, the buffed-up high schooler counts his wages in an alley after throwing the trash out. He solemnly tells himself he needs more night shifts at the convenience store. Later that day, a group of equally fit high schoolers sit around a bench while complaining about the weirdness of not qualifying for the god of high school. One of the group yarns about seeing names he had never heard before among the list of qualifiers, and at that moment, a nervous girl in glasses shakingly asks for the way to the arena. The pack of boys straighten up and give a detailed explanation of the location while the girl gawks at the chest of their spokesperson. She gushes about his mouth-watering muscles, and the guys rip their shirts apart to show off their well-defined muscles. Meanwhile, Mori, who is still trying to make his way to the arena, daydreams about the possible free food options that will be available at the event. He realizes the biker who had just passed him is a thief who had stolen from an elderly woman. Mori recognizes the woman and turns around to catch up on the thief. In the next scene, one of the shirtless high schoolers expresses his disbelief that a girl as cute as the one standing before them is interested in martial arts. While the girl talks about her love for fit people, Mori hits her on her left cheek with the front tire of his bicycle, and the girl, as a result, lands amid a set of trash cans. Mori apologizes and explains that he is in a hurry, but the girl, who had noticed her broken glasses on the floor, flings at him and drags him by his collar. When Mori tells the girl about the theft situation, she joins him in his pursuit. The two pass by a boy, who works at the convenience store, scrolling through a comment section of a man making a rap song about the woman behind him and her stolen purse. After a long chase, the thief flings several cash bills to distract them, but the girl on Mori's bicycle jumps high into the sky to attack the robber, but unfortunately gets hit in the face by a signboard. The thief begins jubilating his successful escape a bit too early and eventually gets stopped by a helmet-breaking punch from a huge high schooler. Mori and the girl look at the boy in astonishment. At the second preliminary arena of the event, the commentator announces the beginning of the God of High School Soul Primularies, and the crowd makes a loud noise of joy. In the participants' waiting room, while Mori expresses his relief for making it in time to the opening ceremony, the girl demands he replace her glasses he had broken earlier that day. The guy responsible for stopping the thief tells her to meet the hijacker instead. Mori thanks him for stopping the robber and introduces himself as Jin Mori. The other guy smirks and introduces himself as Han Dewi. After the two share a fist bump, they land their gazes on the girl sitting in front of them. The girl reluctantly introduces herself as Yu Mira. At that moment, a staff member calls the attention of the participants in the room to get ready to come out. In the fighting ring, the commentator explains the rules of the game and introduces the participants to the competition. The commentator explains to the players that the bracelet they were told to strap on is used to monitor all the contestants' vitals, 
He tells them to try their best and reminds them that whoever makes it through the preliminary and goes in to win the tournament will have any wish granted by the tournament's commissioners. The announcer mischievously asks the whole of the participants in the fighting ring to begin fighting for the last man standing. After a wave of silence, the participants begin attacking themselves, while a strange man in a private plane watches them through his laptop with a smirk on his face. The commissioners watch the contestants fight while discussing their suspected winner. The secretary of the party member attends to a call. After her call, the announcer welcomes the arrival of a latecomer, Lang Mansok, who has an HP handicap based on 20% of the average HP consumption rate of the remaining participants in the ring. In a quick second, the announced latecomer strikes down a bunch of remaining participants while mocking them for being slow and soft. Mira, who feels for the mocked participants, faces the handicapped man and is only able to land two blows against him. Mori pulls Mansok's pants down and elbows him in his ankle when Mansok kicks him. The handicapped man takes a liking to Mori. In a database, a superior staff demands an explanation after viewing a video of the cross-marked island. Other superior officials assume the marked island is the work of Sheriok. A few seconds later, the whole computers in the database get hacked, and an officer advises the president to evacuate the building premises immediately. A strange man appears in the room and introduces himself as Park Mujin from the Republic of Korea National Assembly. At the preliminary location of the competition, one of the commissioners asks Mujin's secretary for her employer's whereabouts. While Mira walks home, she chastises Mori for having a house on the same route. She realizes that Han Daewi also walks on their trail. Daewi explains that his house is on the same route as well. After displaying a little more drama, Mira turns around and continues her walk home while chastising Mori for popping up randomly and annoyingly. Daewi wonders about the sort of technique the contest people perform on the participants. While the three pass through a bridge, they each admit their reasons for joining the match in the first place. Mori confesses that he wishes to fight all kinds of guys and get stronger. Daewi has a flashback to his sick friend battling cancer and calmly tells them that his reason for joining us is for money. Mira tells them that she wants to revive her family's sword dojo. Mori asks her why she had let people snatch the sword so easily initially, and Mira blames it on not having her glasses. Mori confirms her theory after discreetly pulling out the sword she was holding. When Mira tries to get it back aggressively, the sword accidentally drops into the water under the bridge. Mori remorsefully apologizes, but gets slapped in the face by Mira. She demands he leave her presence before searching the shallow parts of the water for her sword alone. While searching for the wooden sword, Mira has a flashback of her late father, asking her to find a strong successor and not to let their sword fighting style die out no matter what it takes. She recalls that after that fateful day, she abstained from any distractions and devoted her whole life to the sword style of her family. As her phone light dies out, she solemnly admits that finding a strong successor is all she wishes for. At that moment, Mori approaches the river with a larger torch and offers to join her on her search. Mira tells him to do whatever he wishes, and after a few minutes of searching, she apologizes for slapping him and explains that the sword they were looking for was a gift from her late father. A brighter light shines over the river, calling the attention of the two in the river. Dewi tells them he borrowed the lights from his workplace, and the three join in on the search for Mira's sword. The following day at the arena, the event announcer greets the audience and welcomes them to the Seoul Preliminaries Tournament Arena. He informs them that whoever makes it to the end of the day's tournament will be granted permission to participate in the National God of High School, a tournament filled with the strongest fighters from across the country. The announcer introduces the fighters one after the other. In the contestants' waiting room, Mori takes a nap while the others prepare themselves for their respective fights. Mansuk walks up to him and promises to defeat Mori. He gets aggravated by Mori's snoring, but a contestant, Go Gamato, demands that Mansuk leave Mori alone. Go Gamato tries to lecture Mansuk but gets pulled backward by Mori just in time to escape a kick from Mansuk. In the next scene, the announcer calls the first match of the day, Yu Mira versus Han Daicho. The fight between the two ends in a few seconds, and the announcer declares Mira as the winner. The announcer calls the second match, Jin Mori versus The Beast. Within a split second, Mori defeats his opponent, Manseo, who was watching Mori fighting through a television screen, notices that he uses Taekwondo with punches. After several other matches, the announcer calls on the beginning of a fight between Daiwi and Yes Man. Han Daiwi defeats his opponent after a few hard lunches. In the following scene, Mori excitedly admits that he wishes to fight Mira and Daiwi. After glancing through the pamphlet in his hand, Mori realizes that Mansok is going against Gogamato, and the only way he would be able to fight Mansok is if they meet up in the semi-final. Gogamato walks into the waiting room and pays his respects to Mori for saving him from a gnashing kick from the rogue, Kang Mansok. 
At that moment, the announcer calls the next fight of the day, Go Gamado vs. Kang Manseok. Go Gamado calmly excuses himself, and Mori warns him to be careful about his tough opponent. Go Gamado assures him that even though he is aware of his opponent's strength, he does not fear him, because what he fears the most is losing the battle of wills to a martial artist he deems unworthy of the name. In the ring, the announcer reminds the contestants of the game rules, and Go Gamado solemnly debases his opponent and threatens him that he will regret his actions if he does not release his arm restraints. The announcer asks the fighters to create their stance, and immediately begin the contest. At the beginning of the fight, the audience is convinced that Gogamato is in the lead, but after being blown away from the ring, Monsok removes one of his hands from restraint and returns with an outrageous surge of gory violence. Mansok mocks his opponent while defeating him mercilessly. He has a flashback of him begging for forgiveness from a tyrant, and maniacally tells Gogamato to beg for his forgiveness. The audience watches in fear as Manseok bullies an adamant Gogamato to beg for his life. When Gamato promises to never beg a man like his opponent, Manseok sickly reminds him of his arm restraint threat and releases his other hand. He pulls Gamato up and readjusts his bones while asking him to beg for his life. Mori interrupts the fight, and in anger, he defeats Kang Manseok mercilessly. The commissioners walk into the ring, and the announcer informs the audience about the contestant who has breached the rules of the game. Monsok has a flashback to his past weak self, and demands Mori not to mock him. He sends a massive blow toward them, but one of the commissioners steps in and blocks it. Monsok jumps into the air to deliver another attack, but Mori counters him, and defeats him. Park Mujin walks into the scene and introduces himself as the tournament administration. He informs the audience that the participant who had gone against the tournament rules will be punished once the board decides on a suitable punishment. After his speech, Mori is escorted out of the ring. In a meeting, a man in a red robe turns off the old radio reporting the progress of the high school tournament. The man informs his fellow cult members about their deity's goal for them and shares a prayer after the meeting. In a board meeting, the tournament commissioners are updated about the state of Gogamado and his opponent, Kang Manseok, by Park Mujin's secretary. The secretary informs them that while Gogamado is physically and mentally drained and is unable to participate further in the tournament, Kang Manseok has hit a mental crisis and is also unable to participate in the ring any longer. The secretary reminds them of Mori's intervention in another player's fight and suggests he should be disqualified as punishment. Park Mujin goes through Mori's profile document and is shocked to find out that Mori's grandfather's name is Jin Taejin. In the fighting ring, the announcer informs the audience about the beginning of the ninth match in the tournament. He calls Yu Mira and Ma Mizian to the ring for their face-off. The audience swoons over the two beautiful opponents and chants the names of their preferred fighters, Ma Mizian a female professional Pan American wrestling champion, tells Mira to switch to a different weapon because the wooden sword will have no impact against her. The announcer declares the beginning of the fight, and the two immediately begin their attacks. Mira is surprised that her opponent is a wrestling champion. Mah Miseon casually tells her that when she heard that she could have any wish granted if she won the tournament, she quickly traveled from America for it. She admits that her one wish is to be surrounded by hot men of different types, before resuming defeating Mira. When Mira uses her wooden sword against her opponent, Mami Seon barely flinches. She explains to Mira that as a professional wrestler, she has trained her body to be tougher than iron. Mathmi Seon delivers her legendary move and flings Mira's sword out of the ring. Mira gets back on her feet, and Mami Seon mocks her for not having a weapon anymore. Mira mentions that without one, she can still wield a blade. The two women engage in a back-to-back -back attack, but this time, Mira can physically injure her opponent. She uses a sword style called Swordless, and successfully defeats Ma Mizion in one blow. The announcer stutters while pronouncing the winner of the fight as Yu Mira. Park Mujin and one of the commissioners walk in on Mori, jubilating Mira's victory. Park Mujin informs the young high schooler that his punishment has been decided. He touches his fellow commissioner and tells Mori that if he can defeat the touch personnel, he will be pardoned from breaking the tournament rules. Mori protests that he wishes to find the blonde commissioner instead, and the chosen commissioner looks at him throwing a tantrum. In annoyance, the commissioner informs Mori that he is stronger than his preferred opponent, and Mori agrees with the term that he must remove his eyeglasses while they fight. The commissioner lands a hefty punch against Mori's cheek, and asks him if he thinks it is possible to be a commissioner. 
if one is not stronger than the participants. Park Mujin informs the two men that the match is going to take place on the following day in the fighting ring. While Mira and Daiki walk home in the late evening, they discuss the fate of their friend. While Mira complains about how dumb Mori must have been to butt into someone else's fight, Daiki has a flashback to the fight. With a low voice, he comments on the strength of his friend, Mori, and mentions that he hopes his friend does not get disqualified for his actions. Mori appears behind Mira out of thin air and offers her some of the fruits Park Mujin had given to him earlier that day. Mori tells them that he is to fight a commissioner the following day, and if he wins, his sins will be scrapped and forgiven. Park and his secretary stay behind for a personal meeting. The secretary tells Park that he has been warned about the substance he brought out. She wonders what would happen to an ordinary human if he consumed the items. Park Mujin mentions to his secretary that he had brought the substance out to check if Mori is the actual real deal or not. Mori, who had consumed all the fruits given to him by Park Mujin, begins to cough out blood while having a sudden heart attack. He slumps to the floor in a matter of seconds before finally going numb. Daiki visits his friend, who is a cancer patient at the general hospital, to ask about the progress of his medications. His friend tells him that although the doctors had begun administering another more effective method, the medications cost more than usual, and his sister is already knee-deep into working to cover up for his fees. The invalid friend begs his friend to stop working so hard on his behalf, but Daiwi dismisses his suggestion and asks him to focus on getting better. At a part-time job in an office, Daiwi picks up the trash and gets bullied by three guys. Daiwi keeps his calm and respectfully excuses himself. At the preliminary arena, the announcer informs the crowd of the beginning of the face-off between Daewi and Baek Sung Chul. Baek Sung Chul reads his book and announces that the book contains tips on how to beat his opponent, Han Daewi. Seung Chul, who has discovered all the secrets of fighting, sees ahead of Daewi's attacks. After several failed attempts, Daewi finds a way of studying his opponent's timing and sinks it to his body movement. Baek Seung Chul slips but is saved by Daewi, who declares that only a coward would attack someone in such a position. After the little interruption, the two continue their battle, and after after having a flashback of his sick friend, Daewi levels up his game and defeats his opponent with three stances. The announcer declares the beginning of Mori's fight, and Mori, who had been unconscious since the previous night, suddenly wakes up and makes his way down to the arena. Park Mujin smiles at the arrival of Mori and the announcer begins their match officially after declaring the rules. Mori swiftly appears in front of his opponent, takes off his glasses, and pushes him to the ground. Silence overtakes the arena, and the announcer declares Mori the winner. Out of anger, the commissioner retaliates violently, but gets kicked away by Mori. The commissioner stands up to his feet, releases a monstrous figure from his body, and begins raining attacks on Mori. Mori tries to dodge all attacks, but eventually gets caught by the figure. Just in time, the commissioners walk in and restrain their members from killing a young boy. Park Mujin walks into the ring, tells the commissioner his actions warrant a salary cutoff of three months, and informs Jin Mori of his pardoning. After observing the whole event, Park Mujin confirms that Jin Mori is indeed Jin Taejin's so-called tiger cub and inwardly tells himself there is no way they were letting the high schooler go. Television presenters inform the public about the four last standing participants in the tournament and the battle between Yumira and Han Daewi. While walking across the city road, Mira brags about her possibility of winning against Daewi. Daewi tells her to be gentle with him with an emotionless facial expression. Mori realizes he can only fight the winner between the two and has an exaggerated mental breakdown. A man in a fancy car spots Mira and drives towards her. The man walks out of his car to propose his undying wish to marry her, and three friends freak out at the man's request. In the following scene, Mira's cousin glances through a wedding dress picture collection and asks her several questions out of excitement. Mira explains to her sister that the wedding is going to be a small celebration. Her younger cousin gushes about the idea of Mari getting married to one of the best sports and businessmen in the country. Mira has a flashback to when Seong Jin promised to give the Moonlight Sword the befitting future it deserves. Mira has another flashback to her father's funeral, when almost all her relatives were mocking his death and clinginess to an old sword style. She recalls her uncle eventually takes her in and tries to continue his brother's legacy but fails due to his weakness. In the next scene, Mira's uncle questions Seong Jin on his decision to marry his young niece. Seong Jin tells him he senses something shining in her and calls her a diamond in the rough. He informs the concerned uncle about his plans to make the Moonlight Sword style a preeminent sword style around the globe and promises to make Mira and the rest of her family happy. At a cafe, Jin Mori overhears high school girls gush about the marriage between Seong Nil and Mira. He rushes to Mira's home and questions her about her marriage decisions. Mori accuses her of backing out when the semi-finals were approaching, 
and asks if she still wants to go to the national tournament and fight strong guys. He slams Mira for throwing away her purpose and dreams for a man, but Mira, who is in the process of shoving him out of her house, declares that she is only getting married to save the Moonlight Sword and successfully pushes him out of her house. Mori reports Mira's situation to Dewi, who is in between his shifts as a noodle delivery man. After hearing the rants of his friend, Dewi tells him over the phone that he has work to do and advises Mori to stay away from people's personal lives. After Mori explains in detail, Dewi tells him that even if he is right, they both have no say over Mira's life. On the arranged wedding day, Mira's cousin gushes over Mira's wedding and appearance while her father looks sorely at his niece. Mira's uncle walks up to his in-law to be and politely asks him to call off the wedding, but Mira walks into the scene and assures her uncle that her dreams are finally coming through. She tells her husband to be that she is only choosing him because of his name and ability to make the future of the Moonlight Sword style better. Mira's cousin feels sad after learning the reason behind her sister's wedding. Mira's cousin sits behind the stairs while sulking over the scene she had experienced. Mori appears next to her and confirms his suspicions about the reason being Mira's wedding. At the entrance of the wedding, the bouncers block him and tell him that only people with an invitation can come into the ceremony. While Mori tries to fight them, Mari walks the aisle to join her waiting group. Room. The groom recalls his meeting telling him to acquire the holy sword and the hand that can draw out its power. Outside the ceremony hall, Daiwi joins Mori and offers to hold the guards off while he talks sense into their friend. The two guys walk into the ceremony and accuse the groom of being a villain who is trying to trick Mira into marrying him. Seong Jin blames the guards for being useless after seeing them lying on the floor and announces his willingness to teach the boys a lesson. While Daiwi faces Seinjil, Mori talks sense into Mira. But Mira, who is not having it, begins throwing a fist tantrum and mistakenly hits her uncle. Her uncle gives a small smile and mentions that his brother would not have wanted things to go that way. Mira's cousin lets her know that he wishes for her to find happiness with the one she loves. When Mira asks how to make her dream come true, Mori tells her to do whatever she wants. Mira sheds a tear and apologizes to her ex-fiancee for her newly found disinterest in the arranged mariagi. Seongjin laughs maniacally and tells Mira to stop fooling herself. He admits that all he wants is the Moonlight Sword and its successor. Seong Jin releases a dark, monstrous figure and destroys the setup of the wedding. He slices through his ex-bride's stomach and Mari, in response, defeats him with a single swordless blow. Outside the building, Mari stutters to thank the boys for setting her head straight and ends up flaring up at them. Seong Jin announces the change in ownership of the wooden sword while driving away. When Mori tries to go after him, Mira tells him not to bother, and she mentions that her father's spirit lives on within her. At night, and in the hospital, Deki watches his friend, who is a cancer patient, almost lose his life. The following day, the three bullies try to oppress Dewi during his shift in the office. They mock him for trying to save up for his poor and sickly friend. Dewi, who is not in the mood for endurance, beats the bullies up. In the next scene, Mori, who is on the verge of missing his friends fight against each other, runs to the preliminary arena and sees Dewi punching Mira on the spot. She had acquired an injury when she fought Seong Jin. The audience watches Dewi beat Mira mercilessly, and the announcer, out of concern, holds him off and declares him the winner of the match. Mori looks in horror as Mira lay on the ring floor with blood oozing out of her stomach. In the dark passage, Daewi passes by Mori and coldly mentions that they will meet again in the finals. Han Daewi has a flashback of an event two years before the God of High School tournament. He and his friend Wu Sung Tai, who is sick in the present day, constantly find themselves fighting for no real reason. In the present day, Han Daiwi kneels by the toilet stall and throws up after having visual memory flashes of his sickly friend and Yu Mira bleeding out on the floor of the fighting ring. The announcer calls on the contestants, Jin Mori and Beyond Jae and declares the official start of their battle. Beyond boasts about studying and watching Mori fight closely against Mansok, but ends up being defeated a few seconds into the match. The announcer pronounces Jin Mori as the winner and informs the audience that the finals will feature Jin Mori versus Han Daiwi. Mori pays Mira a visit to the infirmary. Mira mentions that the health workers of the tournament chastised her for not informing them about her injury before stepping into the fight. When she notices the stern look on Mori's face, she warns him to be calm and advises him that Daiwi is not someone one can beat if one is ever thinking things and admits to losing because she is weaker than him. Mori sternly points out that he never expected Daiwi to fight that way, but Mira calmly tells him that they do not know his reasons for switching up on them. In a different room, Seung Tai's sister informs Daiwi that his friend had woken up briefly and asked for him. In the next scene, 
The announcer announces the final round of the God of High School preliminaries and welcomes the contestants. Park Mujin watches the two walk slowly into the ring and wonders out loud who the Tiger Cub is. After the announcer declares the start of the match, the two contestants exchange stern looks for a few seconds before rushing in violently against each other. The two begin their fight aggressively with matching attacks, speed, and counters. While the commissioner watches and drops comments, Park Mujin's secretary receives a phone call demanding she leave the premises. Han Daewi begins gaining on Mori, and after receiving a hefty blow, Mori threatens his opponent that he is going to pay for what he had done to their friend, Mira. The two contestants resume their fight, and Mori lands an almost defeating strike on his opponent. He walks up to Daewi and stretches out his hand to help him up. But Daewi spitefully apologizes and mentions that he had never for once thought of him as his friend. Daewi pulls Mori's hand and attacks him with an exceedingly powerful move. In the infirmary, Mira, who has been discharged, walks along the hallway with her uncle and cousin. Her uncle informs them to wait for him in the lobby, while he finishes up on her discharge documents. While Mira and her cousin make their way to the lobby, Mira notices her limiter beep, which makes her wonder out loud if someone around her is also undergoing nanomachine treatment. Mira walks into the ICU, pays respect to Park Mujin's secretary, and watches a lady cry over her brother's death. Mira realizes that the framed picture by the right of the deathbed is a picture of the dead and Han Daewi in their school uniforms. In the ring, Daewi deals with Mori mercilessly, while having a flashback to his conversation with Park Mujin. He recalls Mujin assuring him that they would treat his sick friend with their nanomachine technology if he wins the God of High School tournament, but Daewi points out that it would be too late by then. Daewi remembers a contract he had agreed on with Park Mujin that if he could win both the semifinals and finals of the preliminary matches, he would heal his friend. Mori secures several injuries in a losing fight against his opponent, and the announcer begins his countdown to end the match. At that moment, Park Mujin informs Daewi about the demise of his friend, and before the end of the countdown, Mori gets back on his feet and gazes hatefully at his opponent. After hearing the unfortunate news, Daewi has a flashback of how he and his friend bonded over a fight against corporate thugs. Han Daewi feels hopeless and loses interest in the fight. Mori rushes his attacks on Daewi, who recalls Park Mujin telling him that even after trying their nanomachine, his friend's cancer had reached a terminal phase. Park Mujin's secretary asks her employer why he did not wait until the end of the match before telling him about his friend's demise, and Mujin tells her that it is when a man is at his lowest, that is when one sees who he truly is. The audience realizes Dewi's sudden disinterest while Mori deals with him mercilessly. Mira speaks through a megaphone and calls the attention of the boys. She hands him an envelope from his deceased friend. Dewi reads through the letter and asks Mira to hold on to it a bit more. The match resumes, and Dewi is back to his old self. While the two contestants engage in battle, Dewi rethinks the letter his friend had written before his death. Sungtae informs his friend about the treatment administered to him by a strange man and tells Daewi that he is grateful to have a friend who is putting his life on the line to fight for him, and declares in his letter that he has no regrets and he does not want Daewi to participate in the battle for his sake anymore. After a series of exchanged powerful strikes, Mori eventually defeats Daewi. Mori walks up to him and identifies him as his friend. Daewi smiles and holds on to Mori and is helped out of the ring. Mira joins in, and they both walk out of the ring. A man with green chest-length hair mocks the performance in the shadows. Another man in a sweater watches the presenter announce the end of the Seoul preliminary tournament over the television, and smirks at the pronounced winners. In the mountain, a group of men in robes ambush Jin Taijin. They threaten him to follow them to futile the role the heavens have bestowed upon him. Jin Taijin refuses and tells the group spokesman to do as he pleases. In the next scene, Mori arrives in his room, looks at the portrait of him and his grandfather, and wonders what his grandfather is up to. Moments later, television presenters welcome two of the tournament's commissioners, Q and O, into their show for questioning. O informs the guests that the national tournament is in two weeks. When asked what sort of fighters will be in the national tournament, Commissioner Q explains that the top three fighters from each regional prelim will participate as a team and the competition will be a team competition. One of the TV presenters announces they have live feedback from the Korg Arena. At the preliminary arena, the announcer notifies the television presenters that they are currently in the middle of the battle between Yu Mira and Bayan Jae to determine the third top fighter of the preliminary tournament. After a few minutes, Yu Mira knocks out her opponent and is declared the winner of the match. Park Mujin announces to his board of commissioners that he has detailed analyses for all the matches conducted so far, and has been able to draw out that a participant in all of the regionals 
possesses the quality of the key. O points out that his discovery is enough to explain the sudden rule change. With a smirk, Park Majin mentions that there are more tigers than he had expected. He further explains that, whether it is trust, bonds, or rivalry, the key will be awakened whenever the contestants turn their strongest emotions into the power that moves them forward. The blonde commissioner discusses Oh Seongjin's recent contact with Yu Mira and points out that there must be some behind-the-scenes involvement and that similar activity has been confirmed around Gangwon and Jeju. Oh mutters the word Nox in distaste, and Q contributes by saying that the Noxes would be bolder during the contest. Park Mujin mentions that he had summoned the Six. In a roadside kiosk, an old man watches Mori and his friends, who are on the other side of the road. Mori, who has no idea that they are being watched, gushes over Mira being able to join them in the Nationals. The three friends joke around while crossing the road, and Mori feels the presence of the man when he passes by him. The old man pays a visit to his former student, Park Mujin, and the two engage in a quick spar. Six defeats the clone of Park Mujin and complains about being busy. Park Mujin informs his master that the boy he had seen in the street is Jin Taejin's grandson, whom he had secretly fed the sage fruit. Six declares that he wishes to take Mori as his student, and that he is also looking forward to seeing Jin Taejin's reaction to it. Park Mujin informs Six that he received word that the Nox has tried to contact him. In the mountains at night, Jin Taejin fights off his attackers and complains about prompting him to destroy the beautiful landscape of the forest. The spokesman in a red robe tells Jin Taejin that their world is about to end, and that the Iron Hammer of Judgment will come down upon the Tainted Age. The man in the red robe summons a giant sword from the sky and releases it on Taejin. In the next scene, Mira reminisces in the shower about being the extra among her two powerful friends. After bathing, Mira visits a grocery store to get the ingredients she needs to make dinner. When Mira tries to reach out for an item, Mira is surprised to see the announcer of the preliminary matches reaching out for the same item. In the next scene, the announcer introduces himself as Sim Bongsa, and Mira is surprised when she realizes he is a blind man. Sim Bongsa congratulates Mira on getting through the prelims and advises her that even though he is aware that she has gone through a lot, the real fight is yet to begin. Mira thanks him and points out that she was only saved by the change of rules, but Sim Bongsa corrects her that she made it to the tournament because of her skill. He mentions that she has yet to draw out the true strength of the Moonlight Sword. Simultaneously, in Park Mujin's office, Mujin discusses with Dai Wei his motive to fight since his friend, who was his success-driving muse, has passed on. Daiwi tells him that he has racked up a huge debt that he wants to pay back, and that he has someone who will remain unsettled if he refuses to pay up his debt. Park Mujin inwardly points out that Daiwi's eyes have transformed into the eyes of a man, and outwardly calls the meeting to an end. Daiwi calls Mujin's attention to ask about the strange power he suspects is at work, behind the scenes of the tournament, and demands to know what it is. With a stern look, Park Mujin tells him the strange power is called Chariok. In the next scene, Mori decides to train at a public park toward the tournament in two weeks. After sessions of fooling around, Mori helps a group of children who have lost their balloon in the branch of a high tree. He twists his ankles after landing wrongly, and the old man, who had been following him earlier on, appears from nowhere and dissolves the pain instantly. When Mori asks who the man is, he tells him he has sustained a light sprain, and Mori suddenly realizes that the pain in his ankle has disappeared. In the next scene, Simbongza advises Mira not to base on strength alone, but should instead put her feelings into her sword. Mira asks him why he is helping her, and Simbongza tells her that he was blinded by the Moonlight Sword. After his speech, Simbongza walks away with his family. Bongza feels the presence of an enemy, and orders his wife to wait for him in the car with his child. Sim Bongza faces a hired assassin disguised in a bunny uniform. The disguised Nox assassin gives out a maniac lock and unmasks himself in the now empty park. In the next scene, Park Mujin shows Dewi the strange painting on the wall. He explains that in the national tournament, Everyone he will face will be people who borrowed otherworldly powers that transcend human understanding. He adds that drawing forth the powers of the gods and making them one's own is what the god of high school is all about. In an open area, two high schoolers violently greet each other. The guy with shorter hair claims his victory, and a security man walks up to them to warn them of the area. The other guy with long hair summons his chariot underneath the security man, but the one with shorter hair helps him immediately step in to save the security man. The guy, Jegal Tayek, with longer hair, smirks and walks away slowly, while his second congratulates him on winning the second round. Jegal Tayek smiles and promises to crush him the next time they meet. The following day, Mira and Daiwi knock at Mori's door. Mira accuses Mori of always sleeping in on important days. Mira complains about her sore shoulder, 
and with three pokas of his fingers against her shoulders, Mori dissolves the pain. On their way to the tournament, Dewi tells his friend about the Sharyuk. In the arena, the announcer announces the beginning of the national tournament. Mari is surprised to see that another announcer has replaced Sim Bongsa. At that moment, the board of commissioners watches a news report about the death of Sim Bongsa. In the first match, Mori and his friends fight against the group with the oldest high schooler. Simultaneously, in another scene, the assassin responsible for Sim Bongsa's death laughs maniacally at Commissioner Q, who is pinned against the wall with a heavy sword. The announcer announces the beginning of the first match of the tournament. Mori, who is in the first round, fumbles after mistakenly weakening the wrong nerves in his body in an attempt to strengthen his attacks. Six, who is in the shadows watching, freaks out when Mori's opponent is declared the winner. While Mari and Daiwi drag a paralyzed Mori, the other team celebrates their win. In the second round, Daiwi faces the oldest high schooler in the tournament. In the next scene, the Nox assassin mocks the commissioner he had pinned against the wall and jokes about Sim Bongsa crawling and begging for his life. Commissioner Q, who had had enough of the assassin's maniac jokes, summons his charyak and slices off his hand. Q melts the weapon nailing him to the wall, removes his stats-checking wristband, and orders the amputated assassin to shut up. Simultaneously, in the ring, Daiwi is having a hard time with his opponent. He eventually gets back on his feet and gains on his opponent. The other in the rival group begins to worry about their teammate losing the battle, but the third teammate assures him that their friend is not one to give up easily. She has a flashback to when their teammate was being made mockery of for trying for the high school entrance exam despite his age and him failing the same exam three times in the previous years. She recalls the day she had met him after losing a match she desperately wished to win for once. She remembers a scene in her past of her throwing away her wooden sword in frustration and the older man walking up to her to give her words of encouragement, despite himself being a subject of mockery. In the fighting ring, the older man summons his char yak and advances against his opponent. After landing a heavy blow against Daiwi, he confidently declares that he has a dream to help people who cannot go to school, and he plans to use the tournament to make the dream come true. Daiwi gets back on his feet and declares that he wishes to be stronger, and that getting past him, his opponent, will enable him to take a step forward. The older high schooler summons a giant hammer and wields it toward his opponent. And Daewi, who points out that he cannot afford to lose while his teammate watches, counters his opponent's attack and defeats him in one powerful blow. In the following scene, the Nox assassin tries to run away from the commissioner, but gets his other good hand amputated in the process. When the commissioner lands two heavy strikes of his giant weapon against the assassin, the assassin gives out a maniac laugh and announces that rejuvenation is amongst the power of his chariot and he cannot be killed. But the commissioner shows off a sinister smirk and comments that he could care less about him being unable to die. While the commissioner is dealing with the assassin, Another of two Nox assassins interrupts him. The assassin trembles at the presence of the priest Saturn, who in turn asks why his fellow assassin, Drake, is in the commissioner's house when he and his female colleague were the ones who were ordered to kill the commissioner. Q, who had lost his patience while watching the two converse, attacks the priest. The priest complains about the commissioner's lack of patience and dodges the attack. The priest's partner joins in on the battle and the three begin exchanging attacks. Commissioner O, who had noticed that his colleague's limiter was off, walks into the fight and reminds him that the penalty for removing his limiter without permission is three months without pay. In the fighting ring, the announcer announces the beginning of the final round between the two teams. The two girls battle against each other, and when Mira's opponent is on the losing end, she summons her charyak, an enormous sword, and wields it against Mira. Simultaneously, in the commissioner's house, the commissioners engage in a winning battle against the Nox assassins. In the fighting ring, Mira struggles to dodge the attack launched against her by her opponent. Mira recalls the advice given to her by Simbongsa and implements it into her technique. With one powerful kick, she shatters her opponent's charyak and defeats her. The announcer pronounces you, Mira, the winner of the final round. Meanwhile, in the commissioner's home, the assassins, who are on the verge of defeat, narrowly escape and leave the amputated assassin behind. While Q complains about the assassin they had let go, Drake, the amputated assassin, cries out that they should not ignore him, and suddenly begins swelling until he explodes. In the arena, the winning team jubilates over their success, while the losing team encourages themselves that as long as they do not give up, they can keep trying 
and they will one day reach their goal. While Commissioner Q smokes his cigarette, O walks up to him and points out that the Noxes are truly on the move. In the next scene, Park Mujin's secretary informs him about the attack at the commissioner's home. She points out that the commissioner's home addresses were supposed to be top secret. Park Mujin declares that they have a traitor amongst them before his secretary presents a report on the found body part of Jin Taejin in the mountain. In the next scene, the announcer announces the beginning of the second match of the tournament. The first round of the fight is announced, and the two opponents, Jagel Taek and Jeon Jugok, retain their stance. Before Jeon Jugok can deliver his first attack, Jagel Taek stabs him in the chest with his Cheriox tooth and commands it to chew violently while his opponent is halfway into its mouth. A girl dressed in a maid's attire, who is also from Jeon Jugok's team, walks into the fight and orders him to stop. Jagel Taek defeats her in one move and stomps on her face repeatedly. Mari blocks Mori's part from interfering, but Mori calls her attention to Daiwi, who is already in the fighting ring. The announcer walks in and threatens Daiwi not to interfere with a fight that is not his. Jeon Jugok attacks his opponent and struggles to get back on his feet. He points his weapon at his opponent and confidently tells him that he is in the game with the expectations of his grandfather and the rest of his family. He declares that a loss to the likes of Jigal Taik will not be tolerated. In the process of creating his attack, Jigal Taik lands a defeating punch on his opponent's injured body and sends him flying into the mouth of his charyuk to be chewed on once again. Park Mujin and an older man, John Jugok's grandfather, and a man of high honors, watch Six and other doctors perform surgery on John Jugok. The older man demands the reason behind Park Mujin's decision not to disqualify Jagel Taik after making it clear in his first match that he will wreak havoc on the tournament. Park Mujin tells him that there is a chance that he might be the key. In the arena, the announcer announces the beginning of the first match, and at the end of the first round, he declares the winner. The teammate of the losing team apologizes for his defeat, but his other teammate, Park Ilpio, says they still had a chance to win. In the second round, the previously losing team draws the match. Mira and Daiwi discuss the fighting teams. When Daiwi expresses his interest in fighting the coordinator of the winning group, Park Ilpio, Mari reminds him of the suspension he had obtained from walking into the last fight. Mira complains about her teammates being a couple of dumbheads, but is surprised to see Mori looking ahead with a concerned look. The announcer announces the beginning of the last round of the third battle in the tournament. Jin Mori notices the mark on the back of Park Ilpio's sweater before the two opponents begin their attack. When Park Ilpio's opponent tries to bully him with words, he, in turn, releases a wave of an eerie aura, but his opponent mocks him. Ilpio's teammate comments that all the other opponents that Ilpio had used the move for forfeited the matches. After a challenging fight, Park Ilpio is declared the winner of the final round, and Mori links the image on the victor's sweater to the image on his grandfather's military uniform. While Mira and her teammates make their way home, Dewi has a flashback to Park Mujin, telling him about how to obtain a charyak. He explains the words of Park Mujin to his teammates, and Mora solemnly says that he does not want to borrow someone else's power and would rather get stronger by himself. When Mira tries to talk to him, he immediately announces that he is going the other way, and he will see them when it is their turn to fight. While Mori walks away, Mira points out that their friend is going through something, and Daiwi suggests the possibility of it being because he was called into Park Mujin's office the previous day. Mori has a flashback to the day before in Park Mujin's office, where he was informed of the situation of his grandfather. Mori stops under a shed and reminisces about the information he has acquired about his grandfather. Park Ilpio interrupts his thoughts and declares that he is a big fan of his and asks if Mori can give him a handshake. Mori shakes the strange high schooler and gets pulled into a fight. After a quick spar, Park Ilpio introduces himself by his name and apologizes for not being able to control his urge to have a go at him. Mori assures him everything is okay and uses the opportunity to ask him about the mark on the back of his sweater. Park Ilpio tells him it is his way of showing his respect for Jin Taijin. Fourteen years ago, Park Ilpio's mother abandoned her little son in an unfamiliar place shortly after the death of her husband. Ilpio is forced into training at a very young age and often mocked by his housemaster. But on a fateful afternoon, Jin Taijin walks up to him while strapping a sleeping Mori against his chest. Jin Taijin apologizes for his late arrival and hands over a book his friend, Park Ilpio's late grandfather, had created before his death. Jin Taijin explains that his grandfather, who had studied Taikion all his life, had documented all the moves he had invented and made a book out of it. Jin Taijin mentions that the little boy's grandfather had died saving the world with him. 
He urges the young Park Ilpio to grow fast to become a great man like his grandfather. Mori is fascinated by the story Ilpio had narrated to him. Ilpio asks Mori about his grandfather's well-being, but before Mori can answer, Ilpio blocks an attack sent by Jigal. Ilpio, with a stern look on his face, tells Jigal to leave out people who have nothing to do with their hateful relationship and face only him. Jigal gives off a sinister smirk and walks away. Ilpio warns Mori about the tyrant who has just attacked them, but Mori points out that Ilpio himself seems dangerous, and asks about the state of the hand he had used to block the attack. Ilpio assures him he is fine and expresses his gladness of being able to talk to Mori. He bids Mori goodbye, and promises that the next time they fight, he will not stop halfway. After Ilpio leaves, Mori beats himself up for not being able to move when Jigal attacked them. In the next scene, Park Mujin's secretary tries, but fails to keep Commissioner Q from barging into her boss office. Q enters Park Mujin's office forcefully, and accuses him of letting the Noxes kill Simbongsa's wife and child. Park Mujin sends him flying across the room with just a raise of his marked right hand, and asks Q who he thinks he is to talk to him like a subordinate. He walks up to Q on the floor and flings a bill containing the total cost to repair the building he had damaged. A moment later, Q questions the secretary if she was aware that Bongsa's wife and child were alive. The secretary tells him that that was what she was trying to tell him, before he barged into Park Mujin's office. She explained that the Knox had killed the fake marionette she had made immediately after Bongsa's death, and the real family was moved to a safe location. She informs him that she has a message from Park Mujin for him. She proceeds by saying that adding the day's property damage and the previous incidents caused by him, he is now up to nine months of work without pay. In the following scene, Dewi catches Q trying to retrieve a coin he found under a vending machine. He invites him into the restaurant he works in and offers to cook free meals if he agrees to teach him how to obtain a charyak. When Q asks him his reasons for wanting to obtain a charyak, Dewi explains that he wishes to catch up with Jin Mori and become a friend he can rely on if he has something on his mind. In the next scene, Park Mujin sternly declares that the Nox will no doubt attempt to ruin the tournament. Simultaneously, in another scene, the Noxes are having a meeting. Park Mujin informs his commissioners that they are each permitted to remove their limiters, and whenever they find Nox, they must strike with full force. He adds that they do the same for the traitor among them. Meanwhile, in the Noxes meeting, their priest declares that they must destroy the key that threatens the existence of their deity. Park Mujin, with a stern look on his face, says that they must obtain the key that will bring the Nox's deity down at any cost. In Mira's home, she thinks about how to obtain a Charyuk when she has yet to master the Moonlight Sword style. Her mind wanders to Mori's strange behavior. At that moment, Mira and Daiwi get a notification about Mori on their limiter. In the following scene, Mori looks at the portrait of his younger self and his grandfather. He has a flashback to the moment his grandfather left him in the city and relocated to the mountains. After the flashback, he solemnly tells his absent grandfather that he has turned 17. At that moment, Mira and Dewi barge into his room to wish him a happy birthday. A moment later, Mira explains that they had gotten a notification on their limiter informing them about his birthday. Mori gushes over the sumptuous meals his friends had brought over to celebrate him with, and they all have a fun and happy evening together. Later in the evening, Dewi hesitates to ask Mori about what has been troubling him, and eventually chickens out. The three friends make a pact to never lose to anyone for the rest of the tournament. The following morning, Mori receives an anonymous map and a picture of his wounded grandfather attached to it. While riding his bicycle aggressively, Mori has a flashback to his grandfather leaving him. He inwardly apologizes to his friends and promises to be back in time for the tournament. Television presenters announce that the competition has officially reached the quarterfinal stage and inform the viewers of the two teams going against each other. In the next scene, Daiwi and Mira search around for Mori. P, Park Mujin's secretary, tells them to head back to the arena and asks the whereabouts of Mori. Mira informs her that their friend must have run into some kind of trouble on the way. P tells the two that no matter what reasons they have, if they are not present in the ring when the match begins, they lose by default. She adds that if they could win the first two rounds, they would still win the battle. But since Dewi is suspended from partaking in battles if Mori does not make it in time for the second round, their team will be out of the tournament. While she walks away, she reminds them that the match begins in five minutes. Mira assures Dewi she will ensure their first win while he goes around in search of their friend. Dewi swears he will not come back until he finds Mori, and with a smirk on his face, he asks her to try not to win too quickly. In the ring, 
The announcer announces the beginning of the first fight of the day. Park Il Pio realizes that only Mira has shown up for the battle, and wonders what might have happened to Mori. Before the beginning of the first round, Mira's opponent, who is in a strange veiled attire, smiles and mentions he has been looking forward to fighting her. After the announcer calls the beginning of the match, Mira's opponent unveils himself and shows off his tanned and muscled half-naked body. He introduces himself as Lee Martin, and Mira inwardly apologizes to Daiwi that she does not think she can kill much time given the current state of her opponent. In the following scene, Mori walks into a room to find his grandfather tied up and passed out on the floor. Meanwhile, in the fighting ring, Mira is having a hard time fighting her opponent. After she finally begins to gain on him, her opponent, Lee Martin, is handed Mira's old sword. He mocks her over the efforts she used while training with the sword, when, in reality, she has been all along unaware of the true powers of the sword. Mira, in annoyance, asks him to return her sword. In the next scene, Dewi finds one of the ex-contestants passed out on the floor and hurriedly runs to help him. A Nox assassin appears behind him and creepily tells him he looks good. Lee Martin shows Mira the true form of her sword, and the two engage in a tough battle. Meanwhile, Mori tries to save his grandfather, but his grandfather creepily inhumanly turns his neck and explodes. A man with blue hair emerges from the smoke and tells Mori not to hold his actions against him. The man states his excuse to be that he needed to accelerate the awakening of the key. Mori, in pure hatred, asks who the man is, but the man calmly asks him to shut up and die. Mori finds himself surrounded by doppelgangers. In a church, the priest of the Noxes assigns his fellow members to acquire the sword of their god, as well as the hand that can draw out the power of the sword. In the ring, Lee Martin stabs Mira deeply with her sword and mocks her for being powerless. In the next scene, Dewi fights with the weird contestant, who he recognizes as a contestant in South Gyeongsang's team. He defeats her in two moves and proceeds to help the injured contestant on the floor. While the girl watches with a round mouth, the injured contestant urges Dewi not to worry about him and to go back to his match, but Dewi assures him that it is convenient for him to help him out. The girl stands up and kisses Dewi on his lips. Jagel walks into the scene, recognizes Daiwi, and accuses him of turning up in the most random places. He calls his teammate, the girl who Daiwi was fighting, and they both confidently walk out of the room. On the other hand, Mori fights off the doppelgangers in the smoky room. The main body comments about Mori and has a flashback to the story about the final weapon, Jin Taejin, in the war against the North, who became a hero when he alone survived their death squad's northern-style taekwondo. He recalls the man who defeated every member of the Six. The villain mocks Mori's grandfather as a senile old fool who needs to keep being useful to them until the end. Mori continues fighting the doppelgangers regardless of the villain's words and unfortunately gets led into a hole, leading to another room by the duplicates. In the room, Mori finds the members of the Jeju team passed out on the floor. The villain confirms that the people on the floor are the real members of the team and that the duplicates currently fighting in the ring are their members. The villain declares that now that he has seen the bodies, he cannot let him leave the premises alive. Mori stands and shuts down his nerves from feeling any pain for the next hour. In the ring, Mira's opponent picks her up by her hair, calls her a failure, and repeatedly punches her. Mira collects herself from the floor and declares that there is no way she will lose to a man like her opponent. One of the opponent's teammates says that there is no way Jin Mori is joining her to fight. She assumes they have done evil things to her friend and faces her opponent with a powerful force. The two exchange attacks and Mira falls into a quick trance. In her trance, she declares that she will get strong enough herself until she surpasses her teammates. At that moment, she awakens her Charyok, Lu Fengxian, and reclaims her sword. Lee Martin unleashes his Charyok, a Kraken, and in one strike, Mira defeats her opponent and is declared the winner of the fight. After hearing the announcer call her name, Mira faints but gets caught by Mori, who apologizes for keeping her waiting. The announcer announces the arrival of Jin Mori in the beginning of the second round. Mori's opponent asks about Pei Long, the villain Mori faced in the dilapidated house, but Mori silently looks at him with a stern look on his face. After asking severally without getting a response, Mori's opponent, in annoyance, rushes a series of attacks against Mori. He mirrors the same moves he had used to defeat Pei Long. Mori defeats his opponent. Park Mujin and other commissioners, who are all watching the fight comment that a tiger, Jin Mori, has been raised by another tiger, Jin Taijin. Park Ilpio has a flashback to a national martial arts tournament four years ago. He recalls being asked his reasons for wanting to get stronger. At that moment, Ilpio states his reasons to be him wanting to fulfill the promise he had made to somebody. He remembers Jagal defeating his friend and mocking her for being weak. After the fight, Ilpio's friend is advised by the doctor to go to rehab to help her learn how to walk again properly. He recalls beating Jagal up and threatening him to apologize for what he had done to his friend 
but ends up being taken away by the police. Later that day, Ilpio is approached by a man in a suit who introduces him to the God of High School Tournament. In the present day, Ilpio's cousin and teammate ask him how to go about the tournament they have the following day, Park. Ilpio points out that they cannot afford to lose against the opposing team. His cousin informs him she is aware he has always been excited about fighting against Jin Mori, but Ilpio tells her all that is important is that they win and fix their friend's broken leg. In Park Mujin's office, Mori is being told that although the opponents they had fought are not the real members, it does not change the result of the fight. Park Mujin informs Mori that his team will proceed to the semi-finals. When Daiwi asks who they fought, Park Mujin tells them that they had fought members of a group of people who called themselves the Knox. In the next scene, Paesong accuses Jaegal of coming too late, and Jigal reminds him that he never became one of them, and is only with them because he wants intel. Jigal works away from him after ending him with his charyak and claims that the key will be his. The following day, the announcer announces the beginning of the first match in the semifinals. Daiwi, whose suspension has been lifted, tells Mira that he had injured his face from secret training. In the first round, Daiwi faces Park Sunga, Ilpio's cousin. Daiwi, who is on the verge of losing, has a flashback to Park Mujin, telling him that the Nox's purpose is to get rid of any form of unnatural and borrowed power. At that moment, Mori promises to save his grandfather, but Park Mujin tells them they are too weak to face them, and mentions that if they are strong enough to win the God of High School tournament, he will give them some information about Nox. After the flashback, Dewi awakens his Cheryok, counters his opponent's attack with an even greater force, and weakens her in one move. Park Ilpio tells his cousin to back down from the fight, but she refuses and goes on fighting. When Park Songa tries to attack Daiwi, he borrows the power of his Charyok, counters her power punch, and defeats her. After the round, Daiwi reminds his team that they all had to win, and Mori feels glad to see his friends are concerned about his grandfather. While Park Ilpio kneels beside his wounded cousin, Sung Gyon, the injured friend, accuses Ilpio of pushing himself too hard. She tells him that even though she appreciates his concern about her leg, he needs to fight for his own sake. In the next scene, a Nox priest kills three people and is interrupted by the entrance of Park Mujin. The priest, whom Mujin identifies as Sang Mandeok, mentions that he wanted to help Mujin. He explains that it is a conflict that draws out one's latent potential and states that the reason behind Mujin, hosting the tournament, is to awaken the sleeping key. He removes his veil and tells Mujin he needs a far more powerful trigger to accomplish his wish. At that moment, numerous Nox members walk toward the tournament's arena and form a circle in front of the building. Sang Manduk summons an Omega sign, which unleashes a blue power light amid the curve his members had formed. The light shoots into the sky and unleashes a giant sword with inscriptions. In the ring, the announcer announces the beginning of the second round. Mori, whose opponent is Park Ilpio, comments that from the look on Ilpio's face, they are about to have a very good fight. Park Ilpio informs Mori that, with his level of taekwondo, he cannot lose against him. In the following scene, Park Mujin is barely able to hold off the sword his rival had summoned. Simultaneously in the ring, Ilpio and Mori engage in a tough battle. After a series of attacks, Ilpio lands an attack on Mori, and mentions that his weakness is being bad at close combat. In annoyance, Mori gets on his feet and violently charges against his opponent. Ilpio blocks his power kick and informs him that his second weakness is prepping his techniques before using them and making his next move obvious and predictable. Ilpio throws him against the ring floor, and a horrendous amount of dust takes over the ring. Mori dares his opponent to predict his next move before sending a massive attack against him. Ilpio easily blocks his attack and tells him that his third weakness is that his techniques place too much strain on his body, and in his current state, no matter how hard he tries he cannot beat him. In the next scene, Sang Mandiok tells Park Mujin that no matter how much he endures, he cannot stop him. Sang Mandiok and a number of his members summon their god. Their god takes hold of the giant sword and begins pushing it toward the earth. In the next scene, Ilpio and Mori engage in a close-range battle. Ilpio expresses his disappointment in Mori being Jin Taejin's grandson. While he beats Mori up, Ilpio accuses him of being a weakling. Mori has a flashback to Park Mujin calling his team weak, and begins to wonder how he can beat his opponent. When Ilpio launches a kick against him, Mori injures him with the swordless moonlight technique. Mira recognizes the move Mori had used to be hers and watches her friend defeat Ilpio. Mori uses one of Daiwi's moves, and while a group of men plays music manually, Sang Mandeok, the national treasure user and member of the Six, unleashes an attack against Nox's god. In the fighting ring, Mori rushes an uncountable amount of attacks on Ilpio. In the next scene, the commissioners fight off the members of the Nox who had previously formed a circle. In the ring, Mori defeats Ilpio, and simultaneously outside the arena, 
Sang Mendeok and Park Mujin collectively destroy the sword. In the arena, Ilyo recalls Jin Taejin asking him to coach his grandson if they ever cross paths in the future. While he lies down flat on the ring floor defeated, Ilpyo smiles and inwardly comments that he has fulfilled his promise to Jin Taejin and announces to himself that he also cannot afford to lose. Mira points out that Ilio's stats are reading a negative number and watches him rise back on his feet. Ilpio has a vision of a nine-tailed fox and unleashes bright yellow lights, and the higher-ups recognize the light to be a signification of the awakening of the key. In ancient mythical times, a nine-tailed fox spirit attained immense power. After a thousand years of training, the fox was appointed as the guardian of the god who ruled heaven. Eventually, the deity began to fear the fox spirit until he, at last, ordered the execution. Outraged by the god's betrayal, the nine-tailed fox used its power to destroy half of heaven and then descended to earth. Once the fox had exhausted all of its power, it swore revenge on God and fell into a long sleep. In the ring, Ilpio emerges out of the bright light with additional fox-like enhancement. While Mira feels her body unexplainably tremble, Daiwi opens his mouth in amusement. Jigal discovers that his chariot is resonating and questions if Ilpio is the key. Park Mujin declares that the energy radiating the arena is for sure. The nine-tailed fox spirit that destroyed half of the heavens in ancient times. Sangmandiok looks into the sky and promises to make sure that the spirit of the nine-tailed fox remains asleep for eternity. Park Mujin asks his rival if he thinks he plans on letting him get away. In the ring, Ilpio announces he has just started. Mori smiles and inwardly tells himself to remain calm and stuck study his powers and movement. Ilpio commends Mori for not charging in blindly. Mori delivers his first set of attacks, which Ilpio blocks without effort. After receiving several attacks from Ilpio, Mori gets back on his feet and vows he will never lose. Mori copies his opponent's moves and uses them against him. After delivering his attacks, Mori points out that his opponent is very strong and begins to wonder how to defeat him. While the two contestants engage in close-range battle, Mori realizes that Charyok is not just about borrowing someone else's power, it is more like one is fighting with one's mind and body. Ilpio charges toward Mori and launches a powerful blow, which Mori, with an equal amount of power, counters. While the two are surrounded by an immense surge of power, Ilpio points out that Mori is in truth a strong opponent before sending Firefoxes to finish him off. At that moment, Mori activates his Charyok, releases a powerful bright light that forms a giant cross and destroys the roof of the arena. Ilpio questions what his opponent is and unleashes a set of exceedingly powerful fire tigers. Mori creates a surge of power, which is in the form of a tornado, and counters his opponent's move. Ilpio ascends to heaven and gets smashed down violently to the earth by a big powerful hand. The announcer walks into the ring and declares Mori as the winner. Moi's friends run into the ring and compliment him on his win. Dewi asks him if the power he displayed earlier on was a charyok. Ilpio, who passed out on the floor, wakes up and asks his teammates if he has won, but eventually accepts his fate after his friends inform him he did not. Park Mujin is surprised to learn that the Nine Tails have lost, and Sang Mandiok asks him what the energy they had felt was. When Mujin smirks in return, Sang Mandiok comments that it would be wise to exercise caution and injures P, who had emerged from nowhere. After Park Mujin jumps to save his secretary, Sang Mandiok announces his exit and disappears from Mujin's sight. Mujin drops his secretary, makes a phone call, and orders the call's recipient to secure the key at once. Q, who is one of the recipients of the call, asks if they should start moving, but Mujin tells him to have the enemies wait at the designated location. In the hospital, Ilpio apologizes to his teammates for losing, but his teammates cheerfully tell him he has tried his best. The team gushes about Ilpio's new power, and his cousin points out that he has finally fulfilled his promise to Jin Taijin. Ilpio tells her that the promise cannot be fulfilled right away, and at that moment, Mori walks into the hospital. He tosses Ilpio a canned drink and greets him cheerily. The two engage in a friendly banter, and Ilpio's cousin scolds them to get some rest. Ilpio stylishly demands to have a private conversation with Mori, and his teammates get the message and excuse them. After Ilpio's teammates leave, Mori tells Ilpio his reasons for wanting to win. Ilpio mentions that his opponent in the finals, Jagal Tak, is going to be tough, but if anyone can beat him, he, Mori, can. In the hospital, John Jugok, who refuses to accept his defeat, wanders about the building in search of Jigal. When Jigal is confronted by his ex opponent, he notices that the energy in the ring has hit him. John Jugok unleashes lightning bolts on him, but Jigal simultaneously stabs him severally and apologizes for not having enough time to face him. When John Jugok begins to shoot attacks maniacally, 
his maid and teammate call his attention. Juguk returns to himself, and Jigal seizes the opportunity to use the maid to hurt her master. John Juguk begs his maid to become his strength, and the whole building shakes. A monster emerges from the smoke and cries to its grandfather that it has become strong and will not lose. Ilpio recognizes the monster as John Juguk and watches the monster absorb the people lying on the floor around him. Ilpio charges against the monster, but Jigal steps into the fight and lands his attack before Ilpio can. He warns him off his prey and watches the monster vomit out its maid. The monster mutates and begins sticking its body parts all over the room. Ilpio watches the monster raise his teammates to absorb them. At that moment, John Juguk's maid pleads to the master to keep his composure, but Jagel summons his charyuk and bites the monster's head off. Ilpio's teammates fall out of the monster's grip and find out they each have a missing part. In the next scene, Sang Mandeok calls upon his god to purge the earth, and an outrageous number of monsters pour down onto the earth. In the hospital, Ilpio threatens to kill Jigal. He shoots daggers at Jigal, who smirks at his words and transforms his eye into the eye of the nine-tailed fox. Ilpio attacks Jigal with an unnatural amount of force, and the two men fly out of the building in the aftermath. Park Mujin watches the creatures that Sang Mandiok unleashed on earth, and announces that the god of high school tournament is officially over. Sangmandiok summons an infinite number of monsters through a portal down to earth. Mira and her teammates watch the monsters pour down into the earth. Sangmandiok declares that their god and king shall descend at last. After a series of incantations by Sangmandiok, the Nox's god emerges from a sealed door and descends to earth in golden armor. In the building, John Jugik's grandfather watches his grandson's maid cry over his decapitated body and swears to avenge Jugok's unjust death even if it costs his life. Many years after Jigal was still a kid, his mother sold him to a rich old man who constantly reminded Jigal that despite not being his blood relation, he was the most suitable person to be his heir and inherit everything he had worked for. One day, while the man sits next to Jigal, he tells him that only losers give a reason for their losses, and winners do no such thing because they have faith in their victory from the beginning. Jigal assures his father that he is not going to turn out as a loser, but rather be the one who will inherit his power, money, and the whole world. In the present day, Jigal attacks Ilpio, but Ilpio goes into his fox mode. While Ilpio aggressively defeats the monsters, Jigal calls him out for being an animal just like him. The commissioners defeat the wave of monsters that Sang Mandiok had descended upon the earth. Park Mojin places an X seal to hold off the deity, protected in golden armor from reaching the earth. Sang Mandiok mocks Mujin for once again arriving late, and Park Mujin tells him that if he gets in contact with the key, not a single shred of their world will be left. Sang Mandiok gives out a small laugh and mentions that that is exactly what they want to happen. Mira, who is outside, with her group, wonders out loud if the golden figure in the sky is somebody's charyok. Ilpio and Jigal take their fight outside. While Ilpio punches Jigal severally, Jigal unleashes his charyok and swallows his opponent. After his charyok spits Ilpio out, the key buried in him separates from his body and falls downward. Jigal transforms into his full form and proclaims that the key would be his but one of the unleashed monsters gabs the key from his reach. Song Mandeok receives the key from his monster and rejoices over finally being able to obtain it. At that moment, Mori kicks the key from his grip and picks it up. The armored deity opens its face and adds more pressure to the X-Seal, holding it from landing on the earth. In a room full of computers and a central large screen, a man mentions he wishes to prove that the power of an old god is nothing compared to mankind's science. The man orders a series of jets to fly towards Seoul. In Seoul, a radar operator announces that the presence of nuclear missiles has been confirmed to be heading towards Seoul. The emergency response system contacts Park Mujin and informs him that they have confirmed that the US Army just launched a massive number of nuclear missiles. Park Mujin teleports the children around him into a safe space. In a safe and unknown location, Mori, who had been teleported to a different part of the safety area, hears a familiar voice call Ilpio's name. In a different part of the area, Daiwi uses his charyok to heal Ilpio's injured teammates temporarily. Meanwhile, Mori heals Ilpio and asks if Jagel is responsible for all the damage inflicted on them. Park Ilpio's temporarily crippled friend explains to Mori that Ilpio had been watching him and had made a promise to get him strong enough to beat Jagal. Ilpio wakes up and accuses his friend of spilling his secrets. He asks Mori for the object that got separated from him, and Mori shows it to him. Ilpio mentions that although he does not know what the object is nor why it is inside, 
He senses incredible power in it, and asks him to protect it from Jagal at all costs. A newscaster announces the presence of the unidentified monsters Sang Mandeok had released, and that it is reported that they will reach Seoul in about 40 minutes. While the commissioners deal with the monsters, Q, who places a value of 10 million yen on each of the monsters, calculates his pay range after killing each of the monsters. Park Mujin is reaching his limits. Sang Mandeok mocks him and tells him that he has no hope of defying his deity and that his plan will surely be fulfilled. On the other hand, Jaegal Taik demands to know where the key is. When the two friends neglect to alter any word containing the key, Jaegal changes his mind of annoyance and pours out his frustration on them. Moments later, Mori finds his friends passed out on the floor, and Jaegal asks him about the whereabouts of the key. In the next scene, Halyong launches a powerful blast in the direction, but one of the six present in the fight joins him to resist the sword. The armored deity eventually overcomes the two, and every person present in Seoul mysteriously teleports to a safer location. In the next scene, Mori engages in a losing battle against Jigal, and meanwhile, the commissioners connect the dots. And Six, Park Mujin's master, announces that the person responsible for their safety is Jason. Sang Mandeok commends Jason for his actions. Jeon Jason transforms the nuclear missiles into a wedge that can pierce their god. Jason looks at a terrified version of Sang Mandeok, who begs him to stop what he is about to do and vows to not only avenge his grandson's death, but also to end both of their lives. He breaks through the seal of the deity and unleashes an extremely powerful bright light that takes over the whole of Seoul. After the white light explosion, Moore finds himself in a known location. Mori, alongside his friends, watches Jason perform the final stage of his defeat before surrendering to death. When Sang Mandiok asks for the whereabouts of the key, Jagal latches a part of his body and collects the key. They all witness Jagal consume the key. They each watch Jagal transform from a baby to an adult in a matter of seconds. Jagal transforms into a heavenly light creature, refers to the people around him as losers, and tells them to die. P informs her employer that the deity that had descended over the arena appears to have been shot down by John Jason. Park Mujin asks if they had any response from Jason, but P tells him that she had heard responses from both Jason and Mandio. Mira and Daiwi fantasize about the immense power. Mira snaps Mori out of his trance-like look, and he tells Daiwi that they have to be at their limit. Daiwi informs him that his Charyok has been protecting them all along. When Mira begins talking about Ilpio and the others, Jagal appears in front of her to attack her. While Mira tries to fight back, Jagal promises to reduce her to nothing. Soon enough, Dewi and Mori join the fight. Jigal deems their effort to struggle pointless, and claims that all that awaits those who defy the deity dies a painful death. Jigal asks Mori if he has chosen his part to satisfy his muscular pride. Mori tells him no, and promises to make him pay for what he has done to Ilpio, Sunga, and her sister Dewi and Mira. At the top of his lungs, Mori tells Jigal to apologize to everyone he has hurt. Mori recalls when his master, Six, told him that the most powerful technique that can draw an infinite amount of power is acupuncture, but the body cannot withstand using it at many points simultaneously. Mori declares out loud that he has gone way past his limit and regardlessly attacks Jagal. After a series of exchange strikes, Dewi and Mira join in on the fight, and they both work collectively against Jagal. Jagal unleashes giants and attempts, but fails to crush Mori with one of them. Jagal conjures a spear and tells his opponent to not expect a painless death. Daiwi shields his friends with his body, gets stabbed in the back by the spear, and tells his friends to run. In heaven, a king's subordinate urges him to take action, and, for the king. The king assures his subjects that they sound not bothered standing. The king sends forth an object called Nyoibo down to the earth. The object lands, and Song Mandiok looks at them in shock. Realization watches Mori touch the object and transforms. Every other person around watches Mori's transformation in awe. When Jigal asks about the sort of power he possesses, Mori tells him it is called to shrink Nyoibo. He turns the object into a staff and runs after Jigal. After a jaw-dropping fight scene, Jigal reminds Mori of his initial promise to reduce him to nothing, but Mori tells him that he will not back down until he pays for his actions. Mori, who after almost defeating Jigal, reigns a massive force of thunder. Park Mujin points out that, unlike the Charyak, Mori's power is natural and equivalent to a god in the flesh. Mori defeats Jigal, and Sang Mandiok vanishes from the scene out of fear. Mira and Dewi walk up to Mori to ask how he feels. Mori gives a sad expression and tells them he is hungry. The three sit on the ground of the fighting scene to discuss what had happened to Mori. After a few minutes of talking, Mori begins to feel a bad headache, and Jigal struggles to get on his feet while screaming at Mori to give him his powers. Jigal splits up and transforms into a big and strange-looking monster. When Mori tries to face the monster alone, Ilpio appears behind him and tells him to rely on his friend 
friends more. The four friends join hands to collectively fight Jagal. After a very challenging battle, Mori and his friends defeat Jagal. Jagal has a flashback to his mother selling him to his adopted father before being eaten alive by his Charyak. In a dark cave, Jagal's female teammate waiters about and finds a card in front of an ancient, rusty gate. In the next scene, while the group exchanges their sorries and thank yous, a giant female walks into the scene holding Jagal's teammate in her hand. The strange woman complains about being awake two weeks before the supposed date and points out that the Holy Realm is destroyed. When Mori asks who she is, the lady responds with violence and declares she is older and more important than he is. The lady mentions that by the looks of things, the goal of the god of high school has been fulfilled. And since the three are the last standing, it makes them the winner of the finals. The woman introduces herself as Kim ung -nyo and informs them that she is in their presence to grant them their wishes as promised. Mori walks up to her and asks if he can go back in an instant, but Kim ung -nyo tells him that she can almost the wishes, except for bringing back the dead. Mira and Dewi assure Mors they have nothing to wish for, and are both willing to settle for whatever he eventually wishes for. Mori wishes that everyone who had sustained any form of injury during the fight, gets healed completely. Kim ung Nyeo drops the girl in her hand on the ground and makes Mori's wish come true. Ilpio's team rejoices over their rejoiced body parts. After Kim ung Nyeo turns tiny, Mori asks if his grandfather is alive, and Kim tells him that she senses his weakness. In the next scene, Six mourns the death of his friend, John Jamin, and mocks him for having a glorious death. One of the members of the Six walks up to Six and asks him if he is aware of the awakening of Kim ung Nyeo. With a childish look on his face, he asks him if he has sorted out his feelings for her yet, and mocks him for crying for three days and nights when she rejected him. Park Mujin and his commissioners are in a secret meeting and discussing how they plan to seize the country in the next presidential election. In the next scene, Sang Mandayok makes a press conference to officiate his partnership with a well-known man. Simultaneously, Jin Mori wakes up to find Mari and Daiwi cooking breakfast. The two friends inform him that he has been asleep for three months, and Mori suddenly realizes that he is hungry. He recalls Kim ung Nyeo telling Ilpio that fragments of the key have scattered all over the world, and as its guardian, he must gather them all. When Ilpio asks what the key is, she explains to him that it is a power bestowed upon humans that allows them to break the taboo. She explains further that humans cannot not kill deities because of the restrictions imposed by the deities who feared human power, but when the key is unleashed, the taboo is destroyed. Mira asks if Mori has the power the flashbacks end right before her response, and Dewi tells him that according to ung -yeo, his memories are sealed, and to unseal them, he has to go to Saiten Taisei's homeland. The three friends agree to travel together, and Mori inwardly promises to save his grandfather. In the closing scene, two Nox guards peep into a dungeon and discuss out loud between themselves that their prisoner is the sacrifice they must use to create another god. 